Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Monday, joined by returning guest Pat Flynn and also John DeRosa. We are going to have a conversation, or rather, I should say, these two gentlemen are going to have a conversation. I'm just going to observe and facilitate on the problem of evil. Fascinating topic. Both of these gentlemen very well qualified to speak on the subject. However, I do want to get both of you to briefly introduce yourselves. Y'all are returning guests, but just for those who may not be uh, familiar, John, let's start with you. Just tell us briefly about yourself and your channel, by the way. Sure, Michael. It's it's great to be back on Reason and Theology. I'm a big fan. So my name is John DeRosa. I host the Classical Theism podcast where we do a lot of apologetics and philosophy uh, focusing in on the three core pillars of Catholicism, that God exists, that Jesus is our Lord and Messiah, and that he founded the Catholic Church. And we spend a little extra time on the classical theism aspect, because that's the name of the show. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Pat, what about yourself? Tell us a little bit about you and your podcast. Yeah, great to be back. I'll keep it brief. My name is Pat Flynn. I run the show Philosophy for the People with my co-host, Dr. Jim Madden. He would have been great to have here, but we'll we'll drag him on next time. And we explore all the great philosophical ideas, but we're always doing it through a Catholic lens. So come check us out, Philosophy for the People. Wonderful. Let's start with what are the problems of evil and some major distinctions that are involved. John, we're going to start with you to give us some explanations here. Then, Pat, you can add some clarification. Definitely. And uh, this is kind of like an office hour show, Michael, that we call it on my podcast when Pat comes on and explains a lot of the philosophical research he's been doing lately, and then we kind of jam back and forth on it. But just to start with what the problem of evil is, it's kind of a misnomer to just call it the problem of evil, because it's there's really different problems of evil that people are concerned with. Two of the major distinctions that it's good to make at the outset is between what's sometimes called the philosophical and intellectual problem, where someone comes to this as a puzzle they observe in the world evil and suffering, bad things happening, and they wonder how that's compatible with an all-good, all-powerful, and all-knowing God. And so they want to kind of see what is this puzzle and can it be solved? Can we do some good philosophy or sometimes add some theology that helps us show that these things can be compatible? Or are we stuck with a an incompatibility? That will be the philosophical intellectual problem. But Normally, you know, in your local church, or you probably know people who are going through some difficult times right now, and sometimes we like to distinguish the practical or pastoral problem of someone who is going through a particular instance of evil and suffering. And when you're trying to have a conversation on this topic, you kind of have to do a little bit of discernment to see where a person is at. Are they coming at you like a philosophy student who mm -hmm. just studied an argument and wants to present it? Mm -hmm. Or are they coming at you as someone who's going through something right now? Mm -hmm. Because those are going to be two very different kinds of conversations. In today's show, we're going to focus more on the philosophical and intellectual problem, though some of that can eventually be helpful for someone going through a pastoral or practical difficulty. And in the end, when you're dealing with the pastoral, you're going to need some good theology as well. You're going to need to point people to the love of Jesus Christ and the fact that he suffered for them, that he knows their suffering better and more intimately than we ever could, and that ultimately we think that they can be fulfilled if they cling to him. But those are not the first things we're necessarily going to say in a philosophical discussion about the problem of evil. So that's the first distinction, the mm -hmm. intellectual problem versus pastoral problem. Again, not a super hard line. Sometimes you got to use both. And then the second big distinction is when you're talking about the intellectual or philosophical problem, are you approaching the problem of evil from a logical or evidential standpoint? Is the interlocutor who is using the problem of evil and suffering as an argument against God's existence, are they posing a logical problem where they think that it's actually inconsistent or logically impossible for an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God to exist given the certain kinds of evil or the kind of evil we see or the evil we see? Are they saying that there's actually a contradiction mm -hmm. between uh, holding to theism, the view that God exists, and some sorts of evil? And they can cash that argument out in different ways. We'll talk about that. So if you think there's a logical contradiction, if you think there's an inconsistency, a strong inc incompatibility, you're making what's called a logical problem of evil versus 
you could be making an evidential problem of evil or a probabilistic argument where you just see the facts of evil and suffering in the world as evidence against the existence of God. So perhaps it's you're not claiming that there's a logical contradiction between the existence of evil and the existence of God, but you're laying out some evidence on the table and you think the suffering and evil things that we see happening are weights in the scale that count against the likelihood that God could exist. And if you're making that kind of an argument, we call that the evidential problem. So I think those are two good distinctions you want to get under your belt when you're uh, thinking and talking and researching the problem of evil. One, the philosophical intellectual problem versus the practical and pastoral problem. And then second, the logical problem of evil versus the evidential problem of evil. Excellent. Yeah. Anything that you want to add to that, Pat? Yeah, I'll add a third. I'll add a third problem, and I agree with John. It's it's problems of evil, mm -hmm. and this is an older problem. It's not brought up as much in the contemporary philosophy of religion debates, mm -hmm. but it's something that many thinkers thought about for a long time, and call it the metaphysical problem of evil. How does God create anything that is actual e actually evil? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, is is evil a thing, a positive being? If so, it just seems really strange that a being of pure perfection like God would create any thing that just is evil. So that's sort of in its own category. And there's, of course, uh, a sort of answer to that. I think a good answer uh, that's independent from how you would answer these these other problems of evil. Uh, let me just say at the outset, um, you know, this is the problems of evil. Uh, it's an enormous subject and we are talking behind the scenes. There's just no way we're going to be able to get through everything today. So, you know, maybe this will, will turn into a series. And what John and I want to do is just kind of map the terrain or, or map the territory and show uh, the different ways the problem is is presented some of the some of the main ways and some of the different strategies um, that theists have have taken in responding to these challenges uh, and then if we have time maybe we could start to offer some of our uh, preferred accounts or something like that yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah, so let, let's also talk about theodicy, defense with the pro, uh, problem of evil, and also the philosopher's role when it comes to these questions. So, Pat, if you want to, or John, yeah. actually, either one. Yeah, I was going to kick this one over to sure. Pat because okay. he, he's he's really deep in the literature. So, yeah, what's the difference, Pat, between a theodicy and a defense? And yeah. then what do you see as the philosopher's role? Because you host philosophy, the people you're doing philosophy. <laughs> I do, all the yeah, time. thank you. So, yeah, good, good distinction. Um, a theodicy is some story that we we tell that is mm -hmm. reasonable and consistent within a worldview or classical theistic worldview that we think is actually true. So a theodicy is a story that you tell that uh, isn't just true for all anybody knows, but within your worldview, you think that it is actually true, for example, right? Um, so that one might see that as being a bit more aggressive, whereas a defense is saying, hey, here's some story that is reasonable and consistent in a worldview that maybe I don't even hold. Mm -hmm. But it's true for all we know. It's true for all we know. So a defense is 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 more modest, right? And what the defense is trying to do this is really just trying to undermine confidence uh, in a particular step in the argument um, from evil. And real quick, let me just 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 clarify: we won't talk a whole lot about the logical problem of evil for two reasons. One is that a lot of philosophers have sort of put it into the philosophical dustbin because they've realized that nobody's been able to really bring out exactly what this strict incompatibility is between God and evil. Uh, there's always this, this crucial step of trying to demonstrate that God couldn't have morally justified reasons for permitting evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why you've seen this shift towards the evidential problem of evil. But of course, in responding to the evidential problem, of evil, we're trying to tell a story <laughs> about the reasons God could have that would be, you know, God justifying for the, for the permission of the suffering of our experience. So it takes care of the logical problem of evil. If you have an answer to the evidential problem evil, at least uh, that's that's how I would see it. So by focusing on one, you're going to kind of take care of the other anyways. Can yeah, I follow ahead, up on that, Pat, real quick? Sure. So just just to clarify. So a defense mm -hmm. in the defense, we're giving uh, a possible answer or a possible way to see compatibility in the premises that someone's using against theism. We're not saying that we know like this is our the actual world or this is the way it goes, but possibly this is true. Therefore, their argument against God doesn't go through. Right, right. Like, like, like skeptic, person. you haven't proven that this is false, right? right. So mm -hmm. that's it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And then theodicy, you actually are telling uh, a story that you're putting forth as true. Let's say like this is this is a way 
to, um, shall we put it, uh, justify God in the face of what's being looked at or what we're yeah. noticing here. Yeah, I'll give two quick examples just to make it concrete for people. Um, so uh, in the realm of theodicy, you might look at Eleanor Stump's Wandering in Darkness, where she says, within Aquinas' worldview, here's a story that we can tell about why God permits the negative states of affairs, the suffering and evil, right? And she thinks that uh, if you share Aquinas' worldview, which she does, this is a, this is the true story. This is the story of the actual world. Whereas take somebody like Alvin Plantinga and his free will defense. Uh, a lot of times people sort of laugh at it because they think it just seems kind of ridiculous. But Plantinga doesn't care if it seems ridiculous. He cares whether or not you've proven that it's false, mm. right? Uh, so his defense just says, hey, look, you know, uh, even with natural angels, you have a free will defense if you have, you know, robust free will online. Uh, because it could be that immaterial entities, angels or demons, messed with the natural order. <laughs> And they're the, they're the reason for all the natural evils. And for all we know, maybe that's true. It doesn't matter how ridiculous you think it is, right? Uh, but that, you know, and I don't know if Plantinga actually believes that or not. And I'll personally say, actually, there's not, I don't actually think it's all that implausible. If you have a, hold a traditional theistic worldview and the notion that God delegates certain roles, it's, it's not implausible that, um, you know, angels, demons have some sort of role to play in the unfurling of creation. But Plantinga is not, and people offering a defense are not really interested in proving to you that their story is true. What they're interested in is proving that nobody has proven that it's false. Mm. And that's taking down the logical problem of evil, if that makes sense. I hope Got that's it. clear. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that is helpful in clarifying. So if it's possible that like demons are responsible for tsunamis and bone cancer and other things of that sort on a, on a planting a kind of line, if you can't show that, you know, if you could show that that's possibly true and that, and that's enough to, defeat the strict incompatibility then we're good we're giving a defense even if we're not showing the skeptic that oh and actually this is the case from revelation we don't have to go that extra step to say this is the case we could just say this is possibly the case right in the, is, when we're giving a defense which is enough to you know escape the the logical Got it. problem right yeah uh -huh. okay. uh, and the reason that's worth pointing out is sometimes people will laugh at defenses because they seem implausible certainly to from their perspective but once you understand this sort of dialectic that's that's going on i think you can better appreciate what certain thinkers are up to right mm -hmm. so, so again just to make sure i'm following a defense is this is a possible way of defending and explaining evil in the world but i don't necessarily um hang my hat on it and back it up um theodicy is yeah i really do believe this is a solution and not only a potential solution, I believe it's the correct one. So, yeah, so I think that's good. Maybe just think to make it almost simplistic. A defense, mm -hmm. true for all I know. Theodicy, yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha, yeah. all right. So, okay, so let's maybe talk about some specific problems of evil mm -hmm. uh, that have been offered historically. Um, let's go with you, John. Maybe you can start us out here. Yeah, so I'm just going to give uh, the listeners a, a taste here. I, I brought up four thinkers that I thought are kind of um, summary and that people will come across a lot in discussions on the problem of evil. The first with logical problems of evil, which Pat said, we're not going to maybe focus as much time on, but they're still very important and influential. Uh, J.L. Mackey was an atheist. And in the 1950s, he wrote a famous argument or article defending uh, a logical problem of evil. And his the big premise that you're going to come across in that argument, besides saying that, hey, God's all powerful, God's all knowing, God's all good, is that Mackey says this premise is true, that an all good God would eliminate evil as far as he can. And, you know, Mackey says we look out into the world, it doesn't seem like he's done that. And so therefore, an all good God who's all powerful and all knowing doesn't exist. I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but that's kind of a key premise that people are going to come across. Someone who's defended the logical problem of evil more recently uh, is James Sturba, uh, who has, has written a book on it. And he focuses more on some particular cases of evil, and he says God ought to prevent horrendous evils because to fail to do so is the moral equivalent of God doing horrendous evils himself. And then Sturba combines this which, uh, with the Pauline principle, as he calls it, and says that no one should do evil, even if good can come out of it after, including God. And so Sturba says no one can do evil that good may come. And so... God can't do evil that good may come, and God's permission of certain evils really amounts to him doing the evil. It's kind of like an adult walking by a toddler in a drowning pool, and the adult doesn't save the toddler. 
even though he could have. Did the adult, you know, do the evil of drowning the toddler? No, but Sturber would say he's very much guilty of that permission. And basically, there's not much of a difference between him doing it or not doing it because he could have done it and he didn't. So those are two influential logical problems of evil. And then where we might also focus more attention are on the evidential problems. And there's William Rowe, who uh, poses a famous case of there just being many seemingly unnecessary evils in the world. And he uses the word gratuitous to describe them. For example, you could talk about a fawn or a deer who's trapped in a forest fire and just suffers for, you for a few days and then dies. It doesn't seem like that needed to happen. Um, it did happen. It's it's sad and tragic for this deer. And that's just one of millions and millions of instances that Roe could point to. I don't know about millions. I don't know how, how to quantify it. I don't think he puts a specific number on it. But the fact that there's you know, so many of these cases where it just seems unlikely that they needed to happen, and yet they do happen in the created order, it seems like an all good God shouldn't allow these or wouldn't allow these. So these are evidence or these make it probable that an all good, all powerful, all knowing God doesn't exist. They make it more probable that he doesn't exist. That's William Rowe. And then more recently, um, Draper, who I've totally forgot his first name. Pat, can you Paul. help me out there? Paul, Paul Draper, thank you so much. That's a little embarrassing, but I, I apologize. It happens. So mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Draper, he kind of argues um, with worldview comparison. And he says, if you compare naturalism and classical theism or theism, where you're positing uh, an all good, all powerful, all knowing God, if you just compare these two hypotheses, naturalism and theism, naturalism kind of proceeds according to a hypothesis of indifference. There's just the natural order, the natural world. There's no God. There's no angels, no ghosts running around in it. There's just like natural stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing um, in the natural world that like prefers one set of affairs over another. And he thinks this hypothesis of indifference better predicts the distribution of evils that we see. He says, given naturalism, it's more likely we'd, we'd have a world like this um, than we would uh, given classical theism and an all good God. Like, for example, God wouldn't use like eons and eons of evolutionary animal suffering to create higher creatures, Draper might say. But who can say that nature wouldn't do that? I mean, nature's totally indifferent. Nature doesn't care about using eons and eons of um, evolutionary animal suffering to uh, to get to the kind of creatures that we have now. Nature's not trying to get to anything. It's just totally indifferent. And so Draper sees the distribution of evils that we have as more plausible or more probable on naturalism than they are on theism. And so he thinks that's a very strong argument against affirming theism. So that's kind of the terrain uh, Michael, and then we're, we'll probably spend the, the rest of the show kind of diving into different yeah. kinds of responses. But those are two influential logical problems of evil, okay. as well as evidential problems of evil. Pat, anything to add to that? No, it's a it's a good uh, overview of what's going on. Uh, there's obviously a, a lot I want to say, but I'll, I'll hold on and try and stay organized. John is much more organized person than I am kind of shoot from the hip. And he came with the outline. But I will say one quick thing. I think that um Upon analysis, as we'll see, that 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 Sturba's um, approach will ultimately kind of be covered by a response to the evidential problem of evil again as well. So I think it's like for the theist, you know, at least for me and, and the work I, I've done on this and the thought I've, I've put into this, um, the most interesting, the most challenging is the is the one coming from Draper. And I think once you start to think about that and respond to that and challenge a challenge, what you get out of that, I think gives you the resources to cover these, these other um, versions of it, if you, if you will. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's now shift to talking about theistic responses to the problem of evil, if y'all want to. And Pat, if you want to maybe start out with an outline. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to outline a, a number of different strategies uh, theists have, have taken. I'm not endorsing all these. I just want to get them mm -hmm. on the, the table to start so people can kind of get a lay of the land. And then, uh, like I said, if, if time permits, we can go into our preferred uh, approaches here, right? Uh, so it does it does help, you know, when you're when you're doing the worldview comparison game. Uh, John brought up the analogy of a, of a scale, you know, a two plates, and you're just kind of you know thinking of evidence as weights in the scale. Uh, so what the naturalist is is saying is that 
when when we come to account for the data of negative states of affairs, evil broadly considered or suffering, whatever, uh, we're getting a real big weight on the on the naturalistic side. Why? Because it just seems like the distribution of suffering that we find in this world is not really to be expected if God exists. Maybe it's even impossible if you're taking the strong form, but not really to be expected if God exists. But it's not at all surprising if naturalism is true. And again, this is a very common sense principle. People call it the likelihood principle. We use uh, this type of probabilistic reasoning every day. I might think that if um, you know my sprinkler turns on, then my driveway would be wet. If I go outside and see that my driveway is wet, I think, well, my sprinkler turned on. Why? Because that's not surprising if, if, if that happened, right? Uh, so yeah, pretty basic. Uh, but the important thing to understand when you're making these worldview comparisons, it's it's not just the sort of absolute likelihood um, that any of these will occur on any individual worldview. It's the ratio between them, right? So you might not think that suffering or uh, an evil is all that likely on naturalism. Maybe you think it's only 5% that you'll get a, a world like ours if naturalism is true. But you might think that it's like 0.00001% if theism is true. And it's it's that ratio that matters, right? So in that sense, it would still be sort of confirmatory of naturalism if you think that assessment is right. So that's just a little bit more background. All right, let's talk about different responses then. I'm going to be drawing from a sub stack I, I put up a while ago that got um, uh, pretty good feedback of, it's called eight or so responses to the problem evil. We can, I'll, in fact, I'll give you the link, Michael, if you want to link it yeah. at some point here. Okay. All right. So. Um, the first one uh, is this is a, an approach that's that's favored by a lot of traditional theists, including like Brian Davis. Uh, but it's also an approach that even um, Bill Rowe considers himself a sort of Morian shift. Right. Uh, and this is call it the we know God exists approach. Right. And the claim is that there are other arguments for God that we might call metaphysical demonstrations. Right. There's some features of the world that, you know, the logical connection between that and God is so much more secure than any of the, the reasons we might think evil counts against God, right? So just think of like classic contingency arguments or cosmological arguments or stuff like that, where God is a sort of necessary condition for something, right? Uh, if you have those in place, if you think that those are available to you, then you can just say, hey, look, if two things are actual, they must be compatible. I know that God exists. Nobody's denying that there are negative states of affairs in the world. So it just must be the case that these things are compatible, right? God, mm -hmm. and then just sort of leave it at that. Uh, I don't claim that that's going to be like deeply satisfying to anybody on an mm -hmm. emotional level, but that is certainly not a sort of illegitimate approach that people can take. And Roe Ro actually considers something like this himself. He says, look, if you already have really good reason to think that God exists, then you have reason to think there are no gratuitous evils, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just sort of as simple as that, right? But if you don't have good reason to think that God exists and you think that there are gratuitous evils, then that might veer you towards atheism. So the point is, how you come out of this might depend on how you go into it, right? If you go into it with a lot of good reasons for believing in God, especially if you think there's really strong reasons, uh, you might just take the, yeah, I know God exists approach and just kind of, uh, you know, leave it there. So I start with that one because it's, you know, it's not going to be a, a super uh, satisfying one to a lot of people, especially if they aren't convinced by certain traditional arguments for the existence of God, but I think it's worth putting out there. Uh, is, is this yeah, basically like the appeal to mystery solution? Yeah, it's it, there could be a mysterianism there. That's a different mm. approach, right? I mean, okay. maybe you could layer that on top where you think that there's some print mysterianism often thinks that there's some principled reason of why something should be mysterious to us. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people take a mysterianism position over divine simplicity, right? They don't try and work out some of the issues with divine simplicity because they think there's just good reason for us to think that this is not something we can really penetrate with reason. So, okay. yeah, there's all these problems, but I don't think it's that big of a problem because I have reason to think that divine simplicity is true, for example, but I don't have reason to think that I should be able to kind of work out the mechanics of it. Right. And so they mm -hmm. take a mysterianism approach. Uh, so one might think that that's uh, that that could be yeah, a apply here too. That might be more towards uh, something John's going to get onto later mm -hmm. about God not being a moral agent, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get to that. The other one is more modest, you know, call this a total evidence approach. So maybe you don't think that there's any one or, or any set of like totally demonstrative arguments for God, but you just think that if you're just weighing evidence, sure, you know what, maybe, maybe it is the case that the, all the bad stuff, and I don't say bad stuff to be coy. I'm just trying to use a term that just captures all negative states of affairs. Cause it, with the problem of evil, it's not just moral evil as John talked about, but it's natural evil, not just evil done, but evil suffered. So 
bad stuff, right? Um, maybe you just say, yeah, sure. That just seems like evidence for naturalism. But here's the deal. There's also a lot of evidence for theism, right? And then trot out whatever you think that is. I don't know, contingency, fine tuning, the moral dimension, teleology, consciousness, rationality. I think there's quite a lot, right? So, okay, I'll give you that weight in the scale, uh, skeptic. And maybe it's even pretty heavy. But then when I dump all the stuff on my side, theism still comes out on top. So call that the total evidence approach. This is kind of the approach that Richard, Richard Swinburne takes. Uh, he's willing to uh, grant uh, sort of early on that uh, suffering and evil is uh, evidence against theism, but he thinks that you can alleviate a lot of that if you if you um, uh, pick up Christian theism. Uh, but then he just thinks the total evidence totally uh, favors um, um, uh, theism, right? Okay, so those are just some, I think, like very modest approaches, and then we start to get into some uh, more robust responses here in a minute, but why don't I pause there and see if either you guys have any thoughts, John or, or Michael, before we move on? Yeah, so the, t the two strategies you outlined there, the we, one, we know God exists approach. And I kind of get why Michael brought up Mysterianism, because it does depend, I guess, on which version we're kind of using these strategies in response to. Because if someone does give you a logical problem of evil and your response is, well, I already have a successful argument for God's existence so I'm not really sure which premise is false, but I know the argument can't work. That would be implying some Mysterianism. Mm. But if you're not in the territory of a logical problem of evil and you're just, you know, kind of weighing different evidences and you say, oh, well, we already have really strong arguments for God. Um, we're going to kind of go with that um, over the these other arguments, which, you know, pointing out evil and suffering that they don't seem to be causing as big of a problem to us because we already have a lot of confidence in our arguments for God. I think that's that's fair. And then the second approach you mentioned, the total evidence approach, I, I just wanted to point out that this is totally reasonable, and this is something a lot of people do with respect to evolution, and I think in a justified way. In other words, if someone thinks they have strong evidence for a general theory of evolution um, based on you know multiple different lines of things and um, tracking the fossils and looking at the genetic evidence and uh, looking at the geology and looking at other things. Let's just say a scientist thinks that they have a really good argument for a general theory of evolution. And then someone comes along and says, yeah, but hey, what about um, what about uh, caterpillars and butterflies? <laughs> you know, what about the fact that they have to crawl into this cocoon for a couple of weeks and like, I don't know, eat a lot of food before? I have a, an eight month year old daughter. She likes the hungry cater, the little hungry cat. Oh, it's one of my book. favorites. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's mm -hmm. a great book. Great. I love how it eats all the, I love the page with all the food on it. It's like, it gets me very excited. <laughs> but um, what have you said to that scientist? Yeah. But how would evolution give us this process? Are you kidding me? A caterpillar that eats a lot, goes into a cocoon for two weeks. It doesn't really seem like a survival of the fittest kind of thing. You could, my point is this, you could point to that anomaly and I think that scientist could still say, you know, I'm not really 100% sure how to explain that, but I still think I have some really good, well-substantiated evidence for this general theory of evolution, and I'm sticking with it, and maybe I'll investigate that anomaly further. I just bring that example forth to show that we theists aren't doing something weird if we do that in the God case. If we say, yeah, okay, you're bringing up some anomalies, you're bringing up some pieces of suffering. I don't know exactly how to explain them, but if I look at my total evidence... I still see yeah. the weight in the scale in favor of theism. So that was just a quick point I yeah. wanted to add. That, that's good. Our, our, our friend Kevin here has a good question I want to hit real quick. He says, this this is, this is one is weird to me, if you want to highlight that one real quick. So this is a good point to bring up. He says, uh -huh. and I think he's talking about the no, we know that God exists approach. He says, it seems like someone must hold that one thing is not material evident. God's existence is more certain that something is material evident. Gratuitous evil. But it's gratuitous evil that's exactly up for debate. So we don't want to beg the question, right? So it'd be better to say what is evident is horrendous evil, right? Mm. But whether it's gratuitous is exactly what <laughs> is mm. up for debate, right? And so this is where a skeptical, it might be just be helpful to throw out the skeptical theist response at, at this point, because uh, this is kind of what they're, what they're going for. And the skeptical theist response is essentially this concerning gratuitous evil. Not seeing a reason is not a reason for inferring there's no reason in certain instances, right? So that's an important line. Not if you say seeing, it again, yeah, say it not, again. Not seeing a reason is not itself a reason for thinking there is no reason 
in certain instances. I know a little bit of a tongue twister, but what the skeptical theist is saying is something like this. It helps with a, an analogy concerning gratuitous evils, right? Um, imagine that uh, I don't play chess. You don't actually have to imagine it. That's the actual world. I don't play chess. I know nothing about it, right? Uh, but that John is a chess master, right? So I'm a total neophyte. He's a chess master. I'm just kind of watching what he's doing, right? Uh, any particular move he makes, I might not see a reason for it, right? Why? Because I suck at chess. I don't really know anything about it, right? But I have a reason for not seeing a reason. And it would be unjustified for me to infer that there's no reason for why John made the move that he did. In fact, I have independent reasons for thinking there is a reason, even though, uh, even if I don't see a reason, right? So this is what skeptical theists will say about God is whatever, uh, you know, like Olson will say, this chess analogy is actually relevant to the problem of evil, right? Because whatever the difference is uh, between me and John as a neophyte and chess master, that's laughably minuscule compared to the the, the sort of uh, difference in cognitive abilities between us and God and the reasons uh, that God could encompass for creating this world and allowing the things that he does. We have reason to think that we would not um, have God's, you know, uh, we don't, God sees the the whole pie at once, if you will, as the creator of it, right? Um, yeah, go Can ahead, Can I read yep. a quick quote from, uh, this is from William Lane Craig, just to amplify what Pat is saying here. Craig notes, quote, the brutal murder of an innocent man or a child's dying of leukemia could produce a sort of ripple effect through history, such that God's morally sufficient reason for permitting it might not emerge until centuries later, and perhaps in another land. When you think of God's providence over the whole of history, I think you could see how hopeless it is for limited observers to speculate on the probability that God could have a morally sufficient reason for permitting a certain evil. We're just not in a good position to assess such probabilities, end quote. I'll get you the source on that. That's from Dr. William Lane Craig, which is horrible because it's in my own book. And I just realized, hey, there's no yeah, footnote. Yeah, nothing wrong with no. referencing yourself. <laughs> there should be a footnote to it. It's from right? one of his lectures. I'll get that for you. Yeah. So this is this is this is I was going to get to this anyways, but this is the general skeptical uh, theist response. Right. Is that we might have reasons to think that we're not we're just not going to see the reason. Right. God has his God sized view. We're just a tiny little speck within creation. Right. So we should assume a great sort of uh, epistemic humility in this and what the skeptical theist is is ultimately trying to say is we're just not in a good epistemic position to make the kind of judgments relevant to to running these the an evidential comparison here right they're just putting a, a sort of a skeptical fog over over the whole matter right so they're not even really offering a defense or a theodicy uh but they are still attacking the problem evil with uh with a form of uh i think justified skepticism i think we won't get into it now. I think some forms of skeptical theism are a little too aggressive and they invite problems of their own. But I think a sort of uh, one that Alston develops and points like like Craig are are, are totally uh, worthy of consideration for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, my computer is like keep trying to like it looks like it's trying to go to sleep. So I'm trying to <laughs> keep it awake. <laughs> if I just suddenly you, you blip out at, of existence. Uh, we looked at three replies so far, Pat. So you gave us the we know God exists approach. Uh, then we went over the total evidence approach, and then you just gave us some information on the skeptical theist approach. Are there some other like general categories that you lumped in? Yeah, on that yeah, so, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. So real quick, skeptical theist is just arguing that our inability to not see a reason for God's permitting bad stuff uh, is not a reason to assume with any confidence that there is no reason, right? That there actually are gratuitous, gratuitous evils. All right. So now let's just quickly go back through defenses and theodicies because this is this is this is important too. So. You might even just think of a defense as a sort of weak theodicy. And I won't spend much time on this because we already talked about it at the beginning, but it's a it's a it's a potentially justifying reason that is true for all we know. I like to uh, give examples. A, a good one of this, somebody who's been influential to me is Peter von Inwagen. He's got a great little collection of essays called the um, called the problem of evil. And there he claims that all we need to defeat the evidential problem of evil is some possible story that has the right sort of consequence. Uh, which an ideal agnostic, and he explains what an ideal agnostic is, uh, would admit uh, that that would admit that for all they know that could be true, if God exists, right? So his 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 story is is something of a mild skepticism. It's also more modest, uh, but again, it it relates to what we talked about uh, earlier, where uh, von Inwagen, uh, the story he gives, he's not saying this is actually true, or even that he thinks it's true. Rather, what we should say is what anybody should say is. That could be true for all I know, especially if God exists, right? 
And then uh, a strong theodicy, uh, or just a theodicy, if you want to call it that, is again a story that is reasonable and consistent within a worldview, a worldview that you hold and that you think is actually true, right? That you think is is actually true. So we kind of covered um, those points earlier. The the other one I want to throw in here real quick is what I call the stronger theodicy, mm. and this and and this tries to do a little something extra. So you might think that a can, theodicy, I, can I just interject? I'm yeah, not ahead, shocked John. that mm -hmm. Pat Flynn is about to explain the stronger mm -hmm. theodicy given, given his strength <laughs> with the kettlebells, but sorry, Pat, go ahead. Right. This, is, this is a theodicy that lifts weights, my friends. Right. So, so recall, you know, weights in a scale, go back to that analogy, right? So if the theist is giving a theodicy, really they're trying to say, Hey, actually the distribution of suffering in this world is not really surprising at all. If God exists, it might actually be highly likely, right? It might be a very highly probable consequence if God exists. Now, look, we haven't given that story yet. So like, it's just assertion at this point, but that's what the person who's, who's doing a theodicy is up to. They're trying to say, Hey, and in fact, maybe it's just as likely, if not more likely, if God exists, that we would have the distribution of suffering that we experience. However, we can go even stronger and start to challenge the naturalistic position and say, wait a minute, why should we think that this distribution of suffering really is all that likely? if naturalism is true. Now, John gave this sort of superficial case earlier. Well, naturalism seems to have certain core commitments. Principle of indifference is one of them. Uh, another one that we didn't talk about is source physicalism. And source physicalism says, okay, whatever else you want to say about the mental realm and the physical realm, the physical realm came first. The mental realm is late and local. It's caused by, determined by the physical realm, right? These are sort of core commitments of, of, of naturalism. I think if you break with those commitments, you're be kind of weird to call yourself a naturalist at that point. Some people do, but we won't consider that today. Um, and then the the theist or the agnostic or anybody could really just challenge whether those uh, that sort of worldview should lead us to expect the distribution of suffering that we experience. And my thought is no, it actually shouldn't at all. Like once you get beyond the superficial inspection and get into the mechanics of a naturalistic worldview, the distribution of suffering in our world is extremely surprising. Uh, highly, highly improbable, I think, if naturalism is true. And that takes a good amount of detailing. Maybe we could try to give a, a sketch of that today. But a, lot, but a lot of it will come down to considerations of naturalistic philosophy of mind, how they try to make sense of mental experience. And at the end of the day, I think they're going to have an issue of uh, explaining suffering, especially if their epiphenomenalists and felt experience play no functional, useful role, right? They're going to start to lose that evolutionary explanation. And we can go further with that. Uh, yeah, Pat, I was just going to say, you're getting pretty deep on us, but I think once we, once we finished it, but I like it, it's really interesting stuff. And it's a little like teaser. Yeah. You're researching. Mm -hmm. Once we get through the, um, the survey of things, I plan to bring Draper back up again and let you give like a little bit more of a fuller response. Like re really you're saying it's, it's surprising that we have evil if naturalism is true, but it's not that surprising if theism is true. And I'm, I'm going to have you go yeah. a little bit more deeper into that after the L survey, but that's Let good. me get the two other, uh, yep approaches out uh real quickly uh, very quickly one is called the uh, call it the reformed epistemology approach this goes back to alvin planaga again so how best to summarize this um because it involves his whole epistemology but here's a, a simple way of putting it so planaga rejects the idea that god is actually supposed to be an explanation of our world um or at least that's how we um come to be justified in believing in god right instead planaga maintains that we're well justified believing in god if god exists uh, because that belief is sort of the deliverance of properly functioning faculties operating in their appropriate environment. Uh, so again, for Plana, again, people who are in this reformed epistemology school, which would include our, our uh, friend, very good philosopher, um, Tyler McNabb, Dr. Tyler McNabb, he's, he's a proponent of this. Uh, they believe that theistic belief is actually basic and non-inferential, sort of like my belief that they're, that I'm talking to two people with that are minded like me, right? It's not something I sort of argue to. It's a belief that's sort of occasioned in me that you guys aren't just androids, but you are sort of minded conscious entities like me. It's not something I, I reason up to, right? Uh, but I believe that it's uh, the reformed epistemologists will say that that's a justified belief. It's a basic non-inferential belief because that belief is occasioned. Uh, it's delivered to us by properly functioning faculties operating in the appropriate environment and stuff and stuff like that. Right. Um, so anyways, the details of that are, are, are of that whole epistemology are, are intricate. But for our purposes, the, the short story for now is that Planaga believes that his theory of knowledge can offer a sort of called like an evidential shield and a pretty strong one around theistic belief. 
such that a theist can be well justified believing in God, even if they don't have any arguments for the existence of God or even any responses to mm -hmm. the problem of evil. So that's a, that's like a totally different approach, but I think it has a lot going for it. I won't pursue it a whole lot more in this conversation, but I just want to make people aware that that's out there. And I think, uh, it's definitely worthy of consideration. I don't know, John, if you had any other thoughts on Planica's approach or if you just want me to keep No, going. I think that I think that's a nice little quick summary. I will say some people think that because it's called reformed epistemology, it can only mm -hmm. be practiced by reformed Protestants and so forth. But Plantinga has said that's not true. And he actually wouldn't call it that, you know, if he could mm -hmm. go back and rename it in different cases. And we've had Tyler McNabb on uh, my podcast and another guy, Dr. Gregory Stacy, who defend a Catholic approach to reformed epistemology. Uh, if people are interested in that, they can kind of pursue that in some more detail. But so that's like that's like five approaches so far. And you said you had one more. Well, the last one. And, John, I know this is an approach that that you favor. It's uh, Davis's approach uh, that the God is not a moral agent approach. I'll give the brief summary, then I'll let uh, John expand on this. But, um, yeah, Father Brian Davis, he defends this approach and he means it because he, he maintains that because God is not a moral agent like we're moral agents. Uh, the entire problem of evil is just misguided from the start. So, so Davis emphasizes that when we say God is good, we're not, we're actually not saying that God is like well behaved or, or morally good in a sense that we are morally good, that God is some like great virtuous gentleman or something like that. Right. For Davis, God is, is, is no more subject to the natural moral law than God is subject to the, to natural physical laws. Cause God is what creates and sustains all these, um, so that is, you might you might actually think that that is something of a skeptical theist approach, but I would I would say that these schools are are quite different. Davis is 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 definitely uh, a thinker independent of those who fall into the camp of of skeptical theism. Uh, John, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so it's 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 confusing to people if it's the first time they're hearing it. But Father Brian Davis has a whole book, The Reality of God and the Problem of Evil, where he goes to into it in detail. But I I think he gets a lot right particularly from a classical theist point of view, where we hold that God is simple, immutable, impassable, transcendent, and radically unlike anything in the created order. Father Davis is very much against comparisons of like, okay, I'm going to judge someone's permission or action of a particular, you know, some human being acting in the world, uh, whether to save a child or not. And I'm going to apply that same moral analysis to God and say he's acting uh, poorly or he's acting virtuously. Father Davis is going to say, you can't make that transfer. The same moral analysis doesn't apply because God isn't a creature living in the world. God is the transcendent creator of the whole show. Now, he does affirm that God is good. He does affirm that God is personal, at least analogously so, but he would say he can't be put in that finite category of a created moral agent. And he would even say he's not a moral agent like human beings are. So when you go to analyze his actions or non-actions, you can't just treat him as if he was just one more person among other persons. Now, this gets into a lot of debates and a lot of people um, object to various things Father Davis says, and I think there are ways that you can push it too far. Um, but I'll just say, I think it has a lot going for it, though I think it's helpful in conversation if it's not just the only thing you say or the first thing you say that, you know, God is not a moral agent, so we don't have to give you an answer. Nonetheless, some one of the commenters brought up Job earlier, <laughs> and you could think of St. Paul in, in Romans 9. And there are different places in the Bible where the whole mode and manner and tone of discussion. I know we're, we're going philosophy, so we're not going to do mm -hmm. too much Bible right this second, but the whole tone and manner and mode of the context seems to be, who are you, oh man, to talk back to God? Where were you when I made all this? And Father Davis thinks we have to be careful about not putting too much of a burden our, of ourselves to explain um, you know, we have to justify God with all these different kinds of reasons because otherwise people are going to, you know, justly say that he's guilty and then he won't be God anymore. He just doesn't want us to be that anthropomorphic. Um, he's very much in the apophatic Thomist tradition, you know, to a very big extent. And one of his uh, big influences, Father Herbert McCabe, also very apophatic. They don't think we can know a lot about the divine nature. They are mysterian in that way and that they think God is the mystery that 
the transcendent mystery that created all of this. They do affirm all the facts of revelation. They just don't think we have a lot of thick grasp on who God is. And Father Davis thinks that has a lot going for it when it comes to contemporary objections of evil, like I sketched out earlier in this interview with uh, James Sturba's approach and how he was saying, you know, God was like the guilty adult walking by the pool and watching a toddler drown. Um, Father Davis would kind of resist that inference. Now, he doesn't think that God could just do anything and create some kind of horror show. So there are limits, and, and we'll get into that. Pat has a phrase he likes to use, moral expectations of God, yeah. and he would kind of constrain this. But I just give that, Michael, as a little bit of a sketch, and I personally haven't fully integrated this into my own worldview as to mm -hmm. where I see it as an apologetic response. I think it's relevant. I think it follows somewhat from classical theism and the framework, but I don't think it should be the only thing we say or the first thing that we say. Right? Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm very misguided here in this discussion, so please direct me. Um, it, when we say God is not a moral agent, it sounds like we're saying, well, God isn't the standard of goodness. He's not somehow constrained to a particular standard. He can just mm -hmm. do whatever he wants. Mm. I know that's not what you're saying. Yeah. So let me please just help me understand that. why that's not what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. So, so so Davis does say that God is goodness itself. He mm -hmm. holds to divine divine simplicity. Mm -hmm. When he says he's not a moral agent, he means he's not a moral agent like human beings are, where mm -hmm. they are persons acting in the world trying to be virtuous and avoid mm -hmm. vices. God mm -hmm. stands back from all that, transcends all of that as mm -hmm. the standard of goodness in se itself. Mm -hmm. so, so he would not deny that God is goodness itself. Mm -hmm. um, he would just say that uh, it's wrong to kind of try to carve up his actions in an, in an individualistic way and give specific reasons for them, like we might explain why you know, I drove my daughter to the doctor or why mm -hmm. I did something. We can't analyze the divine action in mm -hmm. the same manner because it doesn't proceed in the same manner. It proceeds from the simple, immutable, transcendent mm -hmm. God. Yeah. It doesn't really uh, make the same kind of sense. But but Davis definitely affirms that God is good. Yeah. He's goodness itself. It's just mm -hmm. not the same moral yeah. goodness of like you okay. or I yeah. or a really great angel. So let but, me just, yeah. Sorry, Michael, did you want to, uh, I was just going to say, yeah. but if he does something good, how does that not make him a moral agent in one sense? So let's, let's think of it this way. Right. And this is where John and I have gone back and forth to this because there's parts of Davis's um, apophaticism that I think are right. There's parts where I think is a bit too strong. So I will agree that God is, is not a moral agent in so far as um you know we are moral agents is that we can have virtues or vices right because god mm -hmm. has no dis dispositions he cannot be perfected mm -hmm. you know like god is of god is the limit case instance of goodness god is identical to the good as such right the unbounded good we are act potency composites right that have to journey towards some end beyond ourselves ultimately god right if you're taking the mm -hmm. theological perspective god just is his own end right however however um Everything acts according to its nature, and that includes God. All Thomas sort of affirmed this. And so I still say we can still have at least broad moral expectations of God, but mm -hmm. you might think that these expectations don't flow from a certain virtue ethic account of God. Rather, they flow from an understanding of the divine wisdom, right, or the divine rationality, right? Uh, and this is exactly what Aquinas thinks. Aquinas, Aquinas thinks that you can have expectations of God, that God won't do certain things like just randomly blip the world out of existence because it would be irrational. That's incompatible with the divine goodness and the divine wisdom and so on and so forth. So I think that there's actually a healthy balance to be taken where, okay, we don't want to put all of the expectations we have of other humans on God. That might be anthropomorphic. But I would caution against becoming so skeptical that you're just completely in the dark right. about the types of things that, that God would do. I think that that's uh, too skeptical, if that means you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these, and these are, and that, honestly, that's why I haven't fully integrated this into my own thought yet. I want to, I would do want to think about it more, and I think Pat mm -hmm. raises some good points that we don't want to press this line too strong or too far, at least not until we're ready to defend it. But Michael, I would say to, to your question about like, mm -hmm. okay, God mm -hmm. does something good. Mm -hmm. um, Davis would agree with that. God can do something that we attribute as good. The problem with the a moral agent, like saying he's a moral agent, we kind of have to ask what we mean. What do you mm -hmm. mean by a moral agent? And mm -hmm. he has a lot of problem with that little article, uh, 
<laughs> the mm-hmm. uh part of the uh moral agent because he doesn't want to say god is just like one other person alongside us could you say he's the community. moral agent yeah, like, or... he, he's moral agency itself okay perhaps you could okay. say or he's but i would say maybe goodness itself but okay. it's not it's not like you could say okay he, he threw a lightning bolt down and like he put it over there so that's a bad action and then he threw another one down and he put it over there that's a good action you can't mm-hmm. kind of do that analysis but mm-hmm. you definitely can have him as the apex of morality and i'll say he has a whole appendix in the book where he said is god morally indifferent mm-hmm. and he says no he is not because god is the standard of goodness he's the creator of mm-hmm. the moral order for us and he sets our natures mm-hmm. on what is good and what is not so yeah. this has actually been a, an interesting back and forth and it's something we definitely want to pursue yeah, and, and yeah think yeah. about some more i know but pat flynn has some really good answers to mm-hmm. to draper's issue that doesn't presuppose any of this father brian davis stuff so if you're off put at all by this response this is definitely not the only game in town yeah. By the way, I just I just want to say at the outset, you know, the idea of, of being off put, because look, at the end of the day, the problem with evil, we all live it. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of emotions, a lot of difficulties. We all we've all faced uh, tremendous suffering in our lives. I just I just assume that everybody is suffering far worse than they typically let on. That's my default mm-hmm. position in life. Right. So we always have to have that tenderness and that care when talking with people and doing people. However, when we're doing this right? Which is the philosophical engagement of the problem evil. The job of the philosopher is to use reason to cut through the fog of emotion and and really try to answer the question, is Mm. this actually evidence against God? And there might be good answers that might seem a little cold or a little callous, but it's that's the sort of coldness of reason. That's what reason is supposed to be. Reason is supposed to be cold. That's just what, that's just what it is. Right. Um, so I don't want to, you know, make too many disclaimers or stuff like that. But I, I feel like that's always just important to point out there. We're not trying to be pastoral here. And I say this because some of the things I'm going to say, especially, you know, concerning uh, the, the evidential problem of evil, there's some responses I think are really good. But uh, at initial impress and impression, they strike people as being you know, kind of cold. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mike, can I press Pat to, to answer? Sure. That yeah. Because this, yeah, yeah. this is where he's been doing a lot of recent research. And I've, I've listened to some of his shows. I think it's really interesting. So, Pat, I wanted to go back to Draper's argument which a lot of people think is the strongest and he's saying this hypothesis of indifference and the assumptions of naturalism better predict the distribution of evils and suffering that we see than theism does um you know given theism we wouldn't expect to see you know all the evolutionary suffering that that, that's that scientists say we have we wouldn't expect to see all the people with with all their ailments and all their psychological sufferings all this stuff but given naturalism you know naturalism doesn't care whether children are suffering or not whether animals are suffering or not so given naturalism it's a lot more likely that we would have this distribution of evils than it would be given theism and i know you've been de- uh, developing some different kind of prongs to how you respond to this i wanted to to really press you to do yeah. that because i'm curious what you think okay so since i know we're going to be limited on time i'll let you guys pick because there's two ways we can go we can go the way of saying actually it isn't that unlikely on theism or we can go the way of saying actually it is quite unlikely on naturalism. Now, ultimately, I want to do both, but just for the sake of time, we should just just pick one that seems more interesting to us. Can we start with the second prong? I think that I think it's interesting to start with the second prong of why it's really yeah. unlikely to have evil and suffering on okay. naturalism, because people just see the hypothesis of indifference. Yeah, there's just like particles bouncing around. Yeah. Why can't there just yeah. be tons good. of evil? Good, 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 good. Okay, so just real quick, in case we don't get back to it, I think the basic theodicies are fundamentally good ones, that God permits a natural arena of suffering uh, to avoid a, a, a massively chaotic world if God's going to create a universe. Some suffering and evil is just going to be concomitant with that as natural entities express certain powers and liabilities. God can intervene here and there, but if he constantly intervenes, then you just have a massively chaotic world, which is meaningless and not valuable at all. As well, I think that the basic free will defenses are fundamentally correct. I would qualify them in ways that are Thomistic friendly, but I still think that a free will defense can be offered and that God can allow a a general arena of of suffering and evil as the best or only available means to get us uh, essentially to become saints, right? And all the process of justification and sanctification and all that, right? So within all that, that soup of material, I think you can start to really raise the expectations of this world on theism, especially once you bring out more traditional principles as well, such as the principle of plenitude, um, you know, that God would want a great hierarchy of being, which I think not only stretches vertically, but 
horizontally through evolution and stuff like that as well. So maybe we can get back to that. But I just wanted to say there's there's a lot of resources that theists can do to tell a story that I think actually is true. Certainly, if you hold like a broadly uh, neoplatonic to mystic worldview in relation to Christian revelation, you can really get the you hit the probability pump hard there. Right. To show that's not unlikely. But going to naturalism. My, my claim is once you kind of look under the hood of naturalism and see what naturalism is committed to, and you look in different areas of naturalism to see how they start to explain things, you actually start to realize, wait, hold on. It doesn't seem like we have a good explanation of suffering at all. So I'll, I'll try and do, I'll give one example here of, of, of how I think this is the case, that once you have a sort of better perspective on naturalism, that you start to, to lose this likelihood that you would have the distribution of suffering and evil. And it's going to be in philosophy of mind. So I'm going to have to introduce some, some new terms and stuff like that. I'll, I'll do my best to, to make it accessible, right? Um, and I'm going to bring out a position that helps to illustrate the general problem, um, but it's not necessary for the problem, right? And that position is going to be called epiphenomenalism, right? So many naturalists are committed to a position known as epiphenomenalism. Right when it comes to philosophy of mind. Now, an Wait, epi Pat, just real quick, Pat, before you go into that, I'm going to let you dive into that. I just want—I yeah. don't want people to lose where we are because you just laid a few things on the table. But right now, Pat Flynn is about to tell us why, given naturalism, I just want to make sure I'm following correctly yep. as well. Given naturalism, it's highly unlikely we would have the evils and suffering that we do. Am that's I right. interpreting? You? Okay, that's, that's what you're about that, to go that's into. That's right. Given yeah. naturalism, you're saying it's highly unlikely we would have the yep. evil and suffering we do. Okay, and go ahead, and you're going to start with yeah. epiphenomena. Okay, so yeah, ep what, what is an epiphenomena? Well, an epiphenomena is anything that is caused, but that itself causes nothing, right? So the causation is sort of in one direction, right? So it's it's something that is itself caused, but has no causal influence on anything else. And to be an epiphenomenalist in philosophy of mind means that um, you maintain that the mental realm, the qualitative dimension of experience, that sort of the felt aspect of experience is uh, is an epiphenomena that is caused by, determined by the physical, but plays no downward causal influence on the physical. Now, let me just say at the outset that I think epiphenomenalism is about as self-evidently false as any position of philosophy could possibly be. There's lots of difficulties with it, many absurd absurdities. It might seem like the felt aspect of desiring this cup of tea is what influences me or causes me to go pick it up and drink it. But the epiphenomenalist says, really has to say that's just a very strange coincidence. It's all the mindless physical interactions underneath that resulted in all that, right? Your felt aspect, the mental realm had literally nothing to do with it, right? Um, it's causally irrelevant. Now, the reason that this is important is because if, if epiphenomenalism is true, it means that the felt aspects of reality just play no causal role. Uh, and the reason that that's significant is because a lot of the, t a lot of the time, people think that suffering makes sense on naturalism, uh, because, you know, uh, pain and pleasure can play certain functional roles in getting us to avoid bears and procreate and stuff like that. But once you start to dive into naturalistic philosophy of mind, you start to lose that explanation because the felt aspect of experience, the intrinsic unpleasantness of suffering, if you will, is causally irrelevant, right? It, it's not doing anything, right? All that matters is this sort of underlying blind physics underneath, but could have gotten the job done just as well, no matter what you felt, or if you felt anything at all, or even felt like weirdly inverted scenarios. So sometimes philosophers talk about these weird inversion scenarios, right? Where it just seems to be the case that if, if naturalism was true, it like any felt experience could have ridden atop any sort of physical functional state, if you will, right? It just could have happened that uh, when I hit my hand against the, a pin and pulled away, it just felt really pleasurable, but I still perform that basic function because the, the, the feltness doesn't make a difference, right? It doesn't make any difference at all. Sounds strange. People are like, that's that's crazy. And I agree, that is crazy. But this seems to be a an inevitable or at least highly probable consequence of naturalistic philosophy of mind. And if that's right, then you can almost immediately see that we actually don't have a good naturalistic explanation of not only the distribution of suffering, of why there's any suffering at all. Right. Let alone the fact that it seems to be distributed in a way that it, at least it's plausible that we're in an arena that's conducive for a theodicy to make sense. Right. It seems like it's definitely plausible that we're in a sort of arena of suffering where becoming a saint is possible. We know it's possible because it's actual. We've seen this happen. Maybe not for everybody, uh, but we've seen this seen this happen. So 
I said, uh, and I'll just try and get through this quickly. If you guys want to interject, go ahead. But I know we're a bit uh, crunched for time. That epiphenomenalism is helpful to illustrate the difficulty, but it's not necessary to uh, drive it uh, drive it entirely. Um, because I think the best response a naturalist could make here is to say, well, look, epiphenomenalism isn't the only game in town, right? Um, and it's sort of a dualist sorting, right? If you're, if you're into philosophy of mind, it seems to be a sort of dualist sorting. So they might say, actually... Uh, the mental realm just is the physical in some sense. So they might be like a, a, a reductive theory, right? Where they're identifying the mental and the physical type, type or functionalist or whatever. There's lots out there, um, but uh, we don't have to go through all of them now. I'll just give one example to show how the general difficulty remains. So let's take, let's take functionalism. Uh, so a function is something that relates inputs and outputs. Uh, and a functionalist, a reductive functionalist to say, whatever pain is, the felt aspect of pain, right? It's just that whatever that function is uh, that gets you to pull your hand back and yell, ouch, uh, when you hit a pin, uh, right? That's, that's, that's what pain is, right? Now, again, I think there's a million issues with this view in philosophy of mind. I think there's decisive arguments against it. Uh, but set that aside, let's just say, okay, maybe this is, this is on the table. Sorry, there's a train behind my house that, that blares its horn very obnoxiously whenever I'm on a podcast, right? But here's, here's the, the subtle uh, but quick and I think powerful point against that proposal and why it doesn't get out of the general difficulty. Functionalism as itself is a very general thesis. It just says that felt aspects are identical with some function or another, but it doesn't specify which. And for all we know, if naturalism is true, all the functions that were useful and selected for could have been associated or identical, sorry, with entirely pleasurable experiences, right? And it would have made no difference whatsoever or it could have been you know it could have just been entirely neutral experiences or no experiences at all uh so unless unless this is a technical point in worldview comparison unless the naturalist so specifies their theory and so complicates it to make it enormously complicated to to spell out uh such a specific version of functionalism to essentially entail the distribution of suffering that we have um they're still going to they're going to face this general problem of of naturalism not predicting the distribution of suffering that we actually have in this world at all. It's not impossible. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but what but if, if if these arguments have force what they show is that it seems to be well virtually impossible, right? It's it's just highly 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 improbable. Uh, that we would have suffering distributed in just the way it is if naturalism is true. And the reason that's important is because, again, it's the ratio that matters. So even if you thought that whatever theistic story we told or are about to tell isn't great, maybe you think, okay, I'll give that a 5% chance or a 1% chance of being true, of why God allows this distribution of suffering. Well, if we tell a story about the difficulties of naturalism along the lines that I just gave, uh, you might think that naturalism is has a far worse story. Uh, and if it's the ratio that matters, then that's all you need to effectively reverse the problem of evil. I apologize for having to like do like hard gear shifts into another area of philosophy to make the point, but I want to emphasize that if you're doing worldview comparison, you need to be systematic, right? One of the things about worldview comparison and about giving a theory, and a theory is just a narrative we give to explain some data, right, is that it needs to be reasonable and consistent within one's own worldview. And the sort of superficial story that a naturalist gives about why we have the distribution of suffering, right? I would argue is not consistent within a naturalistic worldview when you look into philosophy of mind. That's not consistent with it. And once you kind of get clarity of what the sort of range of options are in philosophy of mind, which is relevant to the felt aspects of experience, which suffering is, you you lose. You lose all that anticipation, right, from a naturalistic uh, standpoint. So yeah, there we go. There's a there's a general uh, sketch of of the approach. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to interject and kind of clarify, Pat, because it, it did get a bit technical, but this is an important aspect. And like you were saying there towards the end, I think the way Draper makes the argument kind of invites us to do this these systematic shifts and these worldview comparisons. We kind of got to look at a lot of different things to really assess, you know, given naturalism, given theism. Um, is it more likely that we'd have certain distribution of evils? But just to boil it down, see if I'm understanding you right. Yeah. Are you saying that in order to have the kinds of evil and suffering we do, like that we experience, there needs to be conscious agents that feel and experience the suffering in a particular way? If there were a universe of just rocks, I don't think we would be, well, actually, we wouldn't be here. Right. At yeah. least, you know, um, 
well, we wouldn't be here because we're not just rocks. But if we have the type of suffering and evil that we do, we need conscious agents that can experience it. And the naturalistic theories brought forth to say how you get to conscious agents that experience evil. You mentioned epiphenomenalism, functionalism. You just think those are just so improbable for getting us there to the kind of conscious experience that we have. And therefore, given naturalism, it's 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 not likely that we would have the evils that we do. Am I tracking the argument yeah. or am I missing a key step? Yeah, I would just make one subtle distinction, right, is that um, when it comes, again, to the worldview comparison, um, one might say, well, for there to be a problem of evil, and let's take suffering, because I think suffering is a thing the skeptic really wants to, to focus on, right? Um, that felt aspect. Um, then, yeah, it seems to be this is a problem for conscious entities. And so somebody might say, well, naturalism can't explain consciousness, right? So it doesn't matter. Um, and maybe that's right. But if that's that's right, it's it's actually the problem of consciousness that's doing the work. We haven't reversed the evidential problem of evil, right? So if consciousness reduce, reduces naturalism to probability zero, it's stuck there. It can't really move on to, to try and explain the problem of evil. What I'm saying is, okay, grant that there's some story a naturalist can tell to, to get the mental from the physical, right? Whatever that is. Okay. Even if we grant that, well, now it's the distribution that, that matters, right? It's the distribution. And it's a distribution that I'm saying is highly, highly, highly unlikely if naturalism is true and not at all likely if theism is true. That is a sort of subtle distinction, but it's important if you want to actually um, consider that. Because what we're comparing is not just that there's conscious beings, but there's conscious beings and they suffer. Mm -hmm. right the way we do and right. it's that latter data point that we want to account for not just that there's there's conscious being which i think you is what you're think... saying i'm just clarifying yes. that for no that audience. is helpful right. and you don't think evolutionary natural selection is enough to get us the kind of conscious experience because i think that's the next point i know we're kind of nearing the end here but i think that's kind of a, a follow-up objection that a naturalist is going to press is, no because well, these, hey maybe those just... byproducts are those felt byproducts are kind of needed to um you know cause human beings to avoid painful things right but that's still assuming a position that's sort of dualist right that the mental is causing the physical it plays some causal role so this problem is much deeper or prior than evolution like evolution can't help with this problem once you see these these issues within philosophy of mind if that makes sense right mm -hmm. yeah well, th this is this is some good stuff to pursue um i i wonder pat just briefly if you think it, what you would say just because I know I know we're kind of nearing the end of our time. Or Michael, do you think it'd be better to take a few questions? Well, briefly should, maybe, we, maybe we, we should just say stuff. Yeah, maybe I should just try to say a little bit more about the theistic side uh, okay. because I just kind of scattered a few points there. And then I know we talked about maybe doing a part two and maybe with the part yeah. two, we could just open up, up for Q&A and stuff like yeah. that as well. Just so we don't have to. I'm always sure. like the problem. You, you need to be patient with it. Right. And, and it's just it, there's so many layers. Right. And. You know, this is true of philosophy in general. Like to ask one question in philosophy is to ask all questions ultimately. But the problem of evil seems like especially that, right? For whatever reason. Um, so what what I you know the way I I think about um, the sort of neo Aristotelian uh, neo Platonic you know Thomistic approach to the problem of evil is that I think you should you should marry it with uh, with Christian revelation. I think you should and. Um, because I think in order to give a fully robust theodicy that is true, and certainly we're all Catholic here, right? So like there's, there's like this is our worldview. So we should bring our worldview to bear on the on the on the problem of evil. So that means like we don't have to take just like a purely speculative philosophical position on this, especially if we think that we have good reasons for thinking that the Catholic worldview is true and that it offers certain resources on this issue, which it does. Um, and this, this, I'm going to let you keep talking, Pat, but yeah. this is a point we could definitely explore more in part two. And Michael, you'd be interested in this as well. This is kind of deep is how far can philosophy take you? And then what do we get from church, from, from revelation and from, you know, church clarifying divine revelation and so on? What does that give us, you know, in additional to what just the philosopher could do? But yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say you know, maybe it would be be helpful to even just end, like just mention a couple of of accounts and resources rather than just do a too hasty job in the last couple of minutes. So I mentioned uh, two books or two thinkers that I think if you if you dive into their thought and marry their thought, you're going to get a really robust, really good uh, theodicy. And one is uh, Eleanor Stump's magisterial. Sorry, I'm going to try and hold this so people can see it. 
wandering in darkness. And she is giving a theodicy. She thinks that this story is actually true, that if you start within a uh, Christian worldview with a certain broadly Thomistic metaphysic, this is the story you should should think is true. And she's ultimately going to claim that um, the suffering and evil of our experience um, is the best or only available means that God can use to bring us into union with himself and to psychically reintegrate. She's got this really amazing theory of psychic reintegration, especially as, as is necessary between love between persons, which is free really willed union between persons and that God permitting the general arena of suffering and evil that he does is the best or only available means for God to work with us according to our free, but fallible Liberty to the point of our highest end, which is union with God, right? Many, many, many details in that very thick but wonderful book. The other one, which I think is complementary, is, I mentioned this earlier, is Von Igwagen's The Problem of Evil. Now, this is more of a defense, but I think there's insights in here that 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 marry well with um, Stump's uh, theodicy. And Von Igwagen's thinking of general policy. And I just really want to quickly sketch this out because I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important point um, that helps to see again why it would it be justified to to move from the idea that just because i don't see a reason for this particular evil that there actually is no reason so say that god has good or god justifying reasons for letting sort of natures take their course in the general run and that is without constant divine intervention or interference to avoid a massively chaotic world even knowing that much suffering will result right von Edwagen will say that such a general policy is justified by the overall good it generates or sets the conditions for now, here's one of his critical insights. Almost certainly, God could intervene virtually in any one instance of suffering without subverting the general policy. But even more certainly, God could not intervene in all of them without subverting the general policy. So God will have to draw the line somewhere. And the provocative thought that Von Inwagen throws out there, which I actually think is correct when you really think about it, is probably that line is arbitrary, which means some instances of suffering will fall on the sort of actuality side that could have been prevented without the general policy being subverted. But nevertheless, we should take God to be justified in permitting this because some line must be drawn, and it's because it's a general policy that justifies God's refraining. And if you understand that, you'll see how that applies to Sturba's point or Rose or a lot of the uh, other issues within the... It's a structural response, and you can work out the details, but I think that structural response does a lot of theoretical work, and I think you should think that it is it is true coming from a theistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank y'all both so much. I know we're out of time. Uh, John, go ahead, put in a plug for your channel. Yes, and I just wanted to say, Michael, thank you so much. I love talking to the oh. RT audience and with Glad you, Pat, as always. I was yeah. just going to recommend to people, just in case we do do a part two, leave a huh? comment below on something we missed, something you want to hear more about, something we need to clarify more, or something you're hoping we go more into in next time. But if they want to check out the Classical Theism podcast over at classicaltheism.com, or on any podcatcher, uh, you could see some interesting apologetics and philosophy we're doing. And and you too, uh, Pat, go ahead and put in a plug for your channel. Well, thank you, good sir. And again, thank you, John. It's always a pleasure. I know it's a big topic, and John and I both had sort of hard stop times, so apologies we weren't able to get into all the details. But I hope we gave a good survey and a good you know um, collection of resources for people to begin to really you know, that will, that will serve you, that will help you think this, this, this very difficult, it is hard. It is hard to think about matter through. So it's something that demands a lot of care and a lot of attention. So hopefully we've at least just made something available that may not have been there before for your gentle listeners. Uh, I'm over at philosophy for the people. You can find us on YouTube hosted by me and Jim Madden, uh, YouTube and iTunes. Those are the best places. So thank you so much. Awesome. And I got links to both of those, uh, both of those um, blogs and uh, po uh, podcasts. Anyways, love to see y'all again for a part two. Like John said, go ahead and put in some questions in the comment section so we can have those ready for next time. Anyways, that's going to do it. We'll see y'all later. God bless. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and